This is a production of Cornell University. Um, it's a real honor to be here and a pleasure, guys. Uh, this is kind of like coming to the heart of what this whole program is about. I'm a hydroecologist. I worked in wetlands for almost all my life until about seven years ago, I was put in what was said was a desert. I'm thinking, oh, this is different. I mean, I'm used to water. And so learning a lot about agriculture, water and agricultural systems. And so we have lots of questions. In our, and I thought today, you know, I think I'm going to give an overview of the whole thing. My goal is that it will stimulate discussion and maybe different pieces will appeal to different people and we have lots of direct, lots still to do, lots of things we're trying to learn and if you know something about it, hear me say something that doesn't make sense or you know something different, we're trying to learn about it. So feel free to email me or call me or talk, ask us to say, I wanna to talk to you about that piece. So what you're hearing today is kind of an overview of the whole program, okay? <clears throat> um, I wanna thank, there's a lot of people in this. Probably the most important one is this woman, Dr. Director Li Zhen. She's actually the head of the Ningxia Forestry Institute, the director of the Laboratory of Seedling Bioengineering. She's so influential that she's the one they asked the governor of Ningxia province, which is like the equivalent of a state, we need to restore this area you're in charge. They put her in Congress for China. She's that influential. And she's been a big motivating force. Dr. Sheng Shali at Southwest University in Chongqing is actually responsible for restoration of the Three Gorges Reservoir, the entire riparian area around there. He was here as a Humphreys fellow back in like 2008. He's the one who brought Cornell over and said, these people can help us. Uh, Steve Morielli is over in our department. I'll mention some of the work he does, but he's been my partner in almost all this going back and forth to China. Harold's been influential from the beginning in guiding us. And a lot of people, you'll see, a lot of you see your names up there, who come and talk to you about what we're doing. You've given us advice. A lot of you were really good about being collaborators on proposals and supporting us. So there's a lot of people who have helped in different ways and it's much appreciated. And hopefully we keep, we'll keep building this program. All right, so what I'm gonna do is give you part about what's the framework for what this whole project is about. It's kind of what we've come to understand the system about agriculture in the world, which is what you guys do. Feedback, welcome. And then with that context, we'll talk about what we've been doing in Ningxia, China. We started moving into the Great Plains of the United States in Mandan, North Dakota. And then we have some new directions we're going. So as I said, there's a lot of pieces to this and hopefully I'll keep you with me throughout. All right, the big issue is this one of how to feed the population of the world. Basically, we have 9 billion people by the year 2050, and we have to close a nearly 70% gap between how much we currently produce and how much we're going to need to produce. I do water, so I'm always focused on the water part, and the reality is all the water we consume around the world, 70% of it goes to use for irrigation to grow food. So this is really, to me, an issue of water. Currently, about 2,800 2, cubic kilometers of water consumed each year just for irrigation. Only a quarter of our croplands are irrigated, and that delivers one-third of our agricultural production. So one solution to the food problem is ag intensification. We will increase our yields through more irrigation and more fertilization. But the reality, I do water, is that we are already, water is arguably way, the most scarce limiting resource on the earth. It's not energy, and I'll, fight, I'll argue that a lot. There are all different kinds of analyses of how many people are subject to, global water, to water scarcity. It was always done on an annual basis, and about the approximate number was about 25% oh, of all the world's population deals with some level of water scarcity. And then in 2016, the study came out, well, actually, if you just look in one, on a monthly basis, Four billion people have water scarcity, I mean they don't have enough water in any given month. And so it's really almost half the world's population deals with water scarcity. And up here, where we throw away fresh water, we get rain so much, we get rid of it, it's kind of like, wow, we don't really pay attention to how important this issue is. All this is being exacerbated by climate change because it's changing where and how often and how much rainfall we get. And so this is just one of the model predictions for changes in precipitation around the world. And what you see in brown, as it gets browner, that means you have fewer and fewer inches of rain per year. And that's what we saw like the big drought in California and in large parts of the world, less water to work with. So that issue of let's increase irrigation, to me it's like, guys, that is not a good solution. We need water for people to drink. We need water for all the other uses that we have for water. 
The second big factor is soil degradation. And so again, this is now getting into your realm. That's why I'm pleased to be here. And that land degradation, this was an estimate in 2017, land degradation is estimated to affect about one quarter of all the global land area. And there are different maps showing high severity, very high severity. So large portions of the land are really degraded, which affects their ability to produce crops. And once you have unhealthy soil, then you actually need more water to get the same amount of crops. And this is a photo just showing what we see in, in Ningxia, China, where every single thing you see, if you see something growing, it's got a drip irrigation feed. It's either coming from groundwater, which is very scarce, they don't monitor it, or it's coming from the Yellow River, which also runs dry in location. So it's very, I mean, everything has to be irrigated. All right, the agriculture to grow the food occupies basically 40% of all the land service of the earth, either as cropland or as pastures. And there's that whole issue of, well, we quit eating meat, we can shift this over to growing crops, and it's much more efficient. And that's one of the solutions. When you look at all, what are the solutions to deal with needing to produce food? However, there's this cool fact, and this was the epiphany for me as I was learning about this system. It came out in a 2013 report by the United Nations Environmental Program addressing these issues of how do we grow enough food. And what they did is looked at all the land surface of the earth and said, well, okay, 5,000 million hectares are deserts, glaciers, others, 3,900 are forests. But where we have permanent pastures and arable land, all of that was grassland. Where we put all of our agriculture, which, and almost nine, like 95% of it, used to be grasslands. And that was really interesting. So when you start to think, well, grasslands, huh? There are lots of, like, a lot's been done on grasslands, but interestingly, they basically kind of generally came to three categories, savannas, prairies, or steppes. Even the Great Plains of the United States that we tend to call prairies, actually now in some places they're calling it a steppe. And so you need to think, of, well, there, if it's a third of the land surface of the earth, you'd think there'd be a little bit more diversity to it than just three types of grasslands. And right now, NatureServe, TNC are definitely starting to say, well, that is true. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of grasslands. They're not all the same. And we're getting to understand them better. Okay, but the key point is that grasslands, where we put all our agriculture, developed in areas that are semi-arid or arid, all right? Less than 500 millimeters of rainfall a year. They're naturally evolved to deal with semi-arid conditions, okay? So Whitaker put out a long time ago, the biomes of the world, and here's grasslands, and basically in this moderate temperature range, but low precipitation, were grasslands, and they were incredibly productive historically. This is where you had these incredible, all these different bison, bison, anubs, bovids, all these different migrations, and below ground, you had all this productivity as well. These are millions, in the millions of animals. And below ground, there's all like tons of different species of rodents and prairie dogs, and then there were birds and insects that lived off of it. Here's this incredibly productive, first, um, different levels of the food web, right? all living in a system that was very arid. And yet now, this is where we put our agriculture, and we're having trouble growing things. You think, what, what have we done to that system that's made it now not be able to support what it used to support? Even, we're gonna do, I'm going to be showing you what we're doing in temperate um, grasslands. I don't quite, and one of the reasons, like, I don't know what's going on with tropical grasslands. I don't quite get it, because we're going to be talking about mollusol organic soils that form. But in like Africa, they have some of the highest species diversity of mammals, particularly bovids, which are horn animals that are, have hollow horns, they don't drop off. Incredible species diversity. That meant that those grasslands were stable, long-term environments in order for that kind of speciation to occur. I don't know what the mechanisms are that maintain those systems in terms of moisture, but we're gonna talk about the temperate ones. Nonetheless, here's this thing, all this productivity in semi-arid conditions. One factor in the temperate systems were these mollusol soils, enter you guys, which were deep organic soils that formed because the grasses with decaying roots, decaying leaves that would build up in the soil and have this organic matter that was basically like a cellulose sponge is the way I like to think of it or I explain to people, you know, that you use by your sink. It absorbs and holds water. And so much of the United States, the green here are the mollusol soils up there. There's a whole bunch down in South America large parts of Asia had these soils that were a factor 
in a semi-arid climate that when it rained, it could hold that moisture. All right, so when you look at, this is the most well-documented case that we can find, which are the, the Great Plains of the United States, where mollusols being 60 to 75, 75 or more percent of the soil is a mollusol soil throughout the central, the dark colors, which is right where our tall grass, mixed grass, short grass prairies, mainly those there, occurred. That's, those were our mollusol soils. And then John Deere, 1837. So this is, again, you guys know all this stuff, but for me, you know, I live up in Trumansburg, there's farm fields, there's green tractors everywhere I look to say John Deere. And I think, hey, you know, there's this guy out there somewhere. Oh, he invented the stainless steel plow that was the first thing that could actually break through the grassland sods. And 10,000 of these were sold by 1855. And that's what allowed agriculture to develop in our country. So 1855, we began to break apart the grasslands, the soils, and then we began to erode away. And then in other places, it was livestock overgrazing. But basically, from what I can tell, the surface mollusol soil began to disappear. And the, it's well documented. There was the Dust Bowl in the Great Plains, and it was actually Black Sunday because that was the black organic matter blowing across the landscape. And there's all these you know, very iconic photographs showing loss of the surface organic layer, 16 million acres destroyed in Texas by erosion, terrorists to protect your farm. And it was beginning, from what I can tell, the NRCS and that whole kind of health program, soil health program in the, in the United States. But so as we think about, well, what was the original soil like? It's not that easy to find out. So um, NRCS, start, I can get access to, they began monitoring erosion, and there's all these different maps from 1982 at every like two to four year intervals. And, and so this is 1982, 1987, 92, 97, 2002. These are the rates of erosion per region. And when you add them all up, it was about 180 tons per acre of erosion. And, Carol gave me this great photo, but we can find other photos. And the question is, yeah, but that was already in 1982. Black Sunday was like 1933, and plows were in 1855. That means there's almost 100 more years of erosion that wasn't documented. What did the soil look like? What are these soils that were so productive that could support so much life? What did they look like? That's the one that is well documented. Agriculture has been going on, apparently, for thousands of years. So if you go to Crete, Greece, and this is actually where I was reading this book in Greece right before we went to China, and it's like, oh, Crete used to be covered in, excuse me, shade trees. It was all gone. It was a barren soil. And the only vegetation left was called a frigania, a soil incapable of holding moisture. The only plants left were aromatic drought tolerant shrubs that uh, goats wouldn't need. And all the trees have been, and then you can read about it, taken away either to build ships or around most of the world, they're taken away to, as, to fuel for heating or for cooking. You don't ever leave wood behind. And gradually, what it looks like is a barren landscape, okay? And that was in 425. Right now, in the Pampas of Argentina, a lot of native grasslands are still intact, but conversion is happening again. In this case, it's beef cattle ranching, and erosion problems are happening, and that's like in less than 30 years. And so there's this kind of timeline of the further you go back, it looks more and more thinner and eroded. And so you end up with these maps of global soil degradation. And uh, Ratan Lau out in Ohio has been doing estimates since the 90, 90s. Look, guys, we have depleted global soil organic carbon stocks by as much as 66 picograms. Oh, I don't know if that's right. 72 billion US tons. A phenomenal amount of our organic matter we have eroded away. All right, so that's the background that, as I understand it, that this kind of erosion loss has been going on on what was one third of the land surface of the earth because it was converted to agriculture, but it used to be incredibly productive. In the case of the temperate areas, it was a mollusol soil. I don't know what the soils were in tropical grasslands. I try and kind of learn about that, but we're focused here right now. So now we go to China, and this is China, here's Mongolia, and it's, this is newly desertified. This is seriously, the most seriously degraded lands are desertified, abandoned, and the, the hatching is where this is occurring. And that's in the Google image, we're working right here, and here's the Gobi Desert, Mongolia, 
Taklamakan, and you can see, and this is actually the Yellow River. So there's a big river that runs through there, but the area is seriously desertified. So we're working right here, Yinchuan, and there's Beijing over there. Mongolia is just north of us, just to see. And here's this beautiful river running through, but most of the landscape looks like this, and literally aeolian dunes, blowing sand. But when we were there, it rained. And then it rained again about a week later. It's like, wait a minute, this is not a desert. You have rainfall. Why, what's going on? Why don't you have something growing here? And we began to realize, oh, this was, agriculture since almost at least a thousand to two thousand years ago this is the landscape now but when we went to a museum there were um, petroglyphs of, of grassland animals on the rocks and it became like oh this used to be a grassland you still have rain and we said well where's the organic matter and we spent an interesting couple days driving around trying to get them to show us where there was some organic matter and we couldn't get, we couldn't, we had a real communication. They didn't know what we were talking about. Oh, well, we take all that away. You use that to cook with. You use that to heat with. It's messy. You don't leave that on the ground. It took us a week almost to find the tiniest little layer of organic matter building up. And it's like, oh, this has been so degraded. You've lost track of what that was and what its role was. So the, our project became, well, wait a minute. And there were a lot of pieces else in it as well, but this was the one that, we've really focused on was, well, can you revitalize this system? Can we restore that grassland? Is there some way to jumpstart the whole system instead of just waiting for it to slowly recover? And we're gonna use amendments. We'll try and jumpstart the system to a better level. And then can we help increase their adoption? Either healthier croplands that don't require a lot of irrigation or self-sustaining grasslands. So that was kind of our goal. And so the underlying question, you're going to see this continues throughout. This issue of they didn't quite know what we were talking about keeps showing up. But what's the goal? Ideal goal to me as an ecologist is, well, we want that nice, healthy grassland back with all those animals and all that productivity. Then it's, but can we even figure out what that was, given getting data is pretty hard? And then what's a feasible target? I mean, what's even realistic? Maybe we don't mean restoration. Maybe we mean revitalization or enhancement. Maybe we really need to think carefully about what these words mean. And then what are the elements, and I think of it as a recipe, the ingredients of the recipes that we're gonna to use to achieve that target. So soil amendments, this is your guy's world, been used for thousands of years from manure, all kinds of things. And they either get mixed into the soil or they get put on top of the soil and mulch and compost manures, organic matter, and fine and coarse woody material. And we chose to use coarse woody material from the beginning because we said, well, we need this stuff to be there for a long time. If I put in iceberg lettuce, it's gone in a week. I need organic matter that's gonna stick around a while. And we said, we'll go with coarser material. And we also said, we're gonna look at something different, a different piece of this. We're gonna look at branches, where we apply, not just mixing it into the soil, but we're gonna look at surface applications. So Steve Morielli, who, is a zoologist and was, has been studying for 10 years the effect of forest practices on amphibians, reptiles, animals, near here, down at the Arnott, because now they're clearing, when they take out uh, trees and all, they take every branch. It's worth something. You can grind it up and make particle board. So they were looking for evidence. Well, you kind of need these piles of branches, and they have all these different data on what animals use them as refugia and germination and tree growth and deer can't get to them. But the relevant one was that they looked at water content of the soil, and these are different sites, and they looked at sites that had a pile of branches and bare soil, and consistently had more water retained in the soil over time when the branches were present. And that was our goal. We want more water to stay there. So the very first thing we did was a simple experiment with an honor student. Cornell's honors at undergrads are basically like master students. Other places we have amazing students. And it was a very simple one. Before we went back to China, we said, we've got to make sure this is going to work. We used a very sandy soil. It was an artificial constructed one. We can't, couldn't bring the soils over from China. And all we did was mix in varying amounts of organic matter of wood chips of populus, tremuloides, uh, trembling aspen, zero with the control, 2%, 4%, 10% on a weight per weight basis. We tried different species, populus, black locust, willow, cattails. These are all present over where we are in Ningxia, biochar. And then we put surface twigs as kind of a um, proxy for having branches over the surface. 
and five replicates, put 100 milliliters on top, and then weighed it every day. So what you see is these are the days after water is added, one time, and how much of that 100 mils is still left, percent water remaining. The black line on the bottom is the control. So obviously water is evaporating, there's less water remaining with time. And each of these lines represents the average of one of those treatments, all the way up to, we're gonna focus on populace for today. So here is 4% populace, and after two weeks we had 18% 18 more, 18 more water in the soil that hadn't evaporated. And if we added the litter on top, we could get a few more percent water remaining. So we reduced evaporation by adding wood chips to the soil. We had more water for longer, up to a month. We still were having the same kind of retention in the system. And all it did was control evaporation. We used that as the basis for going to China. And one of, we had two technicians working there who then, the, the first one, Zhigong, turned this into his PhD thesis repeated the experiment, but in kind of ultra, and so here's our control. This is the actual soil over there. It's 90, about 99% sand, no organic matter. The twigs on the top is the equivalent to the, the lattice of branches. We tried mulch. Here's two, five, eight, increasing amounts of populus. They have populus alba, a different one. It's planted over all of China. This is a different, four different species of wood, different tree species, manure, rice, and wheat. And so that's all the different treatments with five replicates each. Looked at a whole bunch of things, infiltration rate, microbial respiration, uh, soil capillarity, um, pore space. He looked at a um, so bunch of things. The point being, that was, a, was set up very similar to what we just did. He weighed them. And I put here infiltration rate instead of all the other data because right away, it was affecting one another property, another process. This is control and twigs with this up on top, so it's like control soil. And any kind of amendment addition reduced infiltration. So there was less water leaching out of the system. That's, so we have another mechanism. Somehow, all right, and I'll pa pause there for a sec. So for me, this was like a no-brainer. Oh, wood absorbs water. You put wood in the soil. It rains. It holds the water. Slowly releases it. Turns out people are really questioning the mechanisms here. And so we're putting more time into like trying to understand what are the precise mechanisms? If you think about it, when I have branches on top of the surface, it shades, so that reduces heat, right? It also affects the boundary layer, so therefore evaporation is reduced. That's a different mechanism. The wood chips in the soil apparently are, we think, breaking up the flow paths, so the water's ability to evaporate is interfered with. We haven't tested my idea that water is just absorbing, the wood is absorbing water, but there's now a whole complex of mechanisms that may be inter all acting together. Rebecca, yeah. how was the water actually applied? Um, in the experiment, the first experiment was literally 100 milliliters. It's a closed container. It was in 25 mil increments slowly at the very beginning of the evaporation experiment. From height or just? No, right, right at the surface, just poured it. OK. As I said, we also are interested, well, what's happening below the surface in terms of life? And so in that, this was Jagan's thesis. And in that very complex experiment, he also halfway through added seeds to the wheat seeds and showed that he could, and, there, and we could affect how much growth there was of wheat. By adding amendments to it, you could affect how much wheat growth we got. Okay, yeah. Sorry, what was the time factor between when you applied the water and then measured the Right, the first experiment was applied one time, just 100 mils, one time, and it ran for a month, about four and a half, five weeks total. This one is a little more complicated. He added it at regular intervals. Once he added the wheat to the system, um, a hold on exactly how much water he added. So it's more complicated. And then we took that and said, all right, well, let's look what's happening in the chemist's work in the field. Those are just three controlled experiments. And we set up in Ningxia. This is the system we're working in. Everything back here is irrigated with a drip tube. We had four treatments. I'll show you what they were, five replicates of each. We had one suite that was not irrigated at all and one that was. And we set that up originally because it rained so little. We said, well, if it never rains, we'll have no data. We'll irrigate one half of it. And there were, so there were 40 plots. And Howard was very helpful in getting the design of this set up for us. So here's the control soil, the unamended soil. Here it is with wood chips of populous alba mixed in to the top 20 centimeters of the soil, 5% by volume. This is the chips plus this lattice of branches. It was about 30% cover, so you can see light 
throughout, hitting the surface. And then we had a surface mulch application. All right. This is temperature over one growing season. So that was one of the original things we saw in the R not forest work. And basically, here are the controls in black hitting above 40 degrees centigrade. We add chips, then surface mulch, and the chips plus the branches to reduce the overall temperatures by almost 20 degrees. So we could definitely keep the system cooler. Obviously, when you have the amendment on the surface, it helped, but even just having chips in the soil reduced the temperature. It also was good, uh, did what we hoped it would do. It helped to maintain, helped to capture more water. So this is the rain event. This is the control. This is the chips plus the branches over top. This is chips, this is mulch. And when the rain event occurs, it captures more rain and then it stays moister for longer. That's just one event. This is in 2012. And then we have the same plots for 2015, four years later, which look pretty similar. This is soil water storage over time. So here's the control. Here's the branches plus the, the chips underground. In this case, this is the chips and this is the mulch. Sometimes the mulch did better, sometimes the chips did better. Branches plus the chips always did way better. So basically over the course of a whole summer, and then four years later, we haven't changed anything. We still have the same improvements in the system to capture and hold water. Okay, we were, let me go back. This had 150 millimeters of rainfall. These are tiny amounts of rainfall over the course of this growing season. And so we said, well, wait a minute, is this normal? Is this what we normally get? So we looked at 15 year record and found what the average amount of rainfall was. And then we looked at, well, how does that come in? It comes in as 21 events, all rain events, that last for about one and a half days, very small amounts, eight millimeters. And the key is how many days before the next rain event. It was four days. If we only consider rains bigger than one millimeter, drop the number of events and increase it to 5.6. So basically, it's tiny amounts of rain, but it comes at every four to five days. Now, why that's important, we're trying to think, well, how do you translate that to does this make a difference? So we calculated what the permanent wilting point was for the system using a very conservative estimate and said, in each of those situations, these were all irrigated, these are not. This is 2012 and 2015 for the controls. And so we basically the days and just this out in that sediment, that sandy soil, you have 50, between 30 and 50 days where the soil is below the permanent wilting point with that rainfall pattern. In those irrigated situations, which got more water, all the amendments helped us to reduce irrigation demand, the number of days below permanent wilting point as compared to the control. So it would make a difference if you put chips in the soil, you can reduce the irrigation demand. In the non-irrigated, where you now know it's just the rainfall pattern, it didn't make a difference with just the chips, but both mulch, there was only four reps here, there are five reps there, but both the mulch and the chips plus the mulch are significantly different. We could definitely reduce under non-irrigated conditions the number of days, and these are, I mean, these are really, dry, guys, 170 millimeters. So we're talking 60 days where it's below the permanent wilting point, but still we can make it better. A bunch of other things were measured, including soil microbial respiration. Um, we have enzyme activity, soil carbon, uh, microbial carbon, microbial nitrogen. But basically what you see is the control and mulch. Mulch does a really good job at keeping it moist, but underneath the soil bulk density isn't changed. The bacterial don't grow. And so adding the chips actually increased the life in the soil. That's the way we like to think of it. Wherever we had wood in the soil, in both the experiment and in the field, we're increasing the whole system's kind of living, functioning below ground. So, so much so that in 2013, in the middle of the summer, we had moss and mushrooms growing in the branch, in the branch chip treatment. So it's moss, we have mushrooms in the middle of the desert. And in 2016, it was awesome. We were out there working. And under a couple of the piles, we go, what are those things? And it turns out they're long-eared hedgehogs, families living back in the middle of that dry, deserty area. And they had set up homes underneath those systems. And so overall, it's a healthier, more living system. We, there's a lot we don't know. But things are working better. OK. It's been difficult work in China. We can't bring souls back. All the money we have is really coming from the Chinese government. 
made it hard to do experiments here. So we said we need to find something we can work in the US. The Northern Great Plains Research Laboratory, which is one of the longest now, it's an LTAER, -E -E it has about 100 years of data for an agricultural station, is located right here. And uh, Harold recommended talking to Dr. Mark Liebig, who said, yeah, come, you can work with us. And it's in the mixed midgrass prairie in North Dakota. And what's totally cool about this is that the climate in North Dakota is almost exactly what we get in Ningxia, China, in terms of both the temperature, Mandan, um, North Dakota's in blue with a high and low for each month. The yellow is China, Ningxia, China. And they're very comparable both in temperature and precipitation patterns. But they don't irrigate, and they do. So the soils are really different. I mean, we have 93% sand, very little organic matter, high pH, different texture. But still, we now have the same climate. It's what can we do to that soil to make it more similar to this, to make it a healthier system. So we're trying to revitalize this system. We actually did an experiment there, the same one. We said, well, here's no amendment in, these are called Talley Porchel sandy loam soils here. We added chips to the soil, branches plus chips. Did this in 2015. Over the course of the summer, biometric water content, we used some decagon probes. Those are the rain events. And what you see is these are the average of, for each treatment. This is the control soil moisture content. This is when we added chips to it. And here's the branch plus chips. And our colleagues, they were very surprised. They thought they didn't really expect it. They go, really? We didn't think this would make any difference at all that we could actually improve the system. Now they don't irrigate. Well, what Mark said is, well, actually our soils are like on the edge. If we keep up with the same practices we have right now, we won't have more erosion. But if they change what we grow, or change the practices, we're gonna start looking like the west and south of here. If you had gone west and south, this would be really important, but we don't need to irrigate. Still, it was really insightful to know that, oh, we can even improve what we're doing in that region right there. And then because we had access to the soils, we started asking some other questions. And so Aaron Mendes, who's the, a doctoral student working with Kyle Walter and us, and BEE started looking. She's very interested in nutrient pollution and used the tally partial soils as the basis to say, well, what happens to, like if we want to fertilize, can the wood chips affect how much nutrients leach out of the system? And she did an experiment and she looked at liquid fertilizers, dry fertilizers incorporated, surface soil fertilizers, and compared with no chips, with chips, and how much nitrogen and phosphorus leach out of the system, giving the chips. What's the role? So that's her, kind of the basis for her thesis. And she's also really starting to look into this issue of what's the mechanism. So they've come up with a really clever idea of using rubber mulch, which I think is like disgusting, but you can buy it all over, like at Agway, bags of rubber mulch made from tires. But it's basically wood chips, only it's rubber chips, so they don't absorb water. So we're gonna do some experiments using rubber chips versus wood chips to try and get a better handle on what these mechanisms are. And that's what she's doing as part of her dissertation. Okay. So that's kind of the core program of what we've been doing, but there's these other pieces to it. All right, one, and this is when I said the benefits of an ecological perspective. It's really interesting. When we're over there, every morning there's condensation due on all the cars. We're probably, I don't know, several miles away from the Yellow River. And this is a desert, guys. And we said, well, wait a minute. If there's condensation, everybody reports water availability as inches of rain, centimeters of rain. But maybe this can make a difference. So we did an experiment growing three kinds of um, grass, prairie grasses under controlled conditions. where weighing them at night, weighing them in the morning, seeing how much water condensed, putting lids on so they couldn't condense any water. And basically, again, I'm giving you a very short synopsis of things. Through condensation each night, the grasses capture 23%, up to one case 46%, of the water they lost in daily transpiration. We also showed in a different small study that they reduce the evaporative loss at night. That's really important. When you're talking 170, 180 millimeters a year, you know, in the growing season, being able to capture water through dew is really key. Now grasses, this is the most exciting part to me, grasses are really cool because they're all these dense stems. They're perfectly if you think about it, it's like a forest of stems, which, you know, wow, how do they photosynthesize? No, the point is they can capture water, it can run down, it doesn't evaporate, they're evolved to capture dew. We don't even think about that. That means if you don't have a grassland, you've lost a key mechanism that was critical to the system's ability to capture and hold moisture. 
I mean, you really got to think about what you're going to grow if you restore that system. And so as an ecologist, guys, we got to get grasses growing back in there. We're doing some work with what species in northern China, Agropyron, Mongolica, I'm learning grasses, but we can definitely improve grass growth. There's difficulties getting them started, but once we get them up and running, we can get more grass to grow. All right, a second area, um, and this is me, I've been arguing this one all along and I'll keep going, is it's about the ingredients of the recipe. What do you put in it? And right now it's coarse wood chips, a little bit of fertilizer. That's a lot of the work that Zhigong did, needed fertilizer. The pure sands doesn't have anything in them. But I am arguing, well, guys, we can put all this stuff in. And so recently there's been a lot of attention on the fact that wood decomposes at different rates. So if you think about it, it's like I say, iceberg lettuce disappears in a week, but woods really vary. And so we used Populus tremuloides, aspen, that 50% gone, the K, the K rate's about one to two years. We definitely noticed by 2015, we were losing, our wood was disappearing. Those wood chips, eh, that experiment either needs to be revitalized, but we don't have quite what we had. But there are bunches of species that decompose very slowly. Black locust is the one I'm familiar with. Farmers will tell you, want to put fence posts in? Put in black locust. It'll last for 80 years. It doesn't decompose. So what happens if we use that wood? What could it do in our restoration recipe? This issue of carbon sequestration is key for mitigating climate change. Uh, Ratan Lau and a bunch of people have put out estimates of where can we do use grasslands as a key for, rest, for dealing with carbon. <coughs> and soil restoration is a piece of it. People haven't done much with it. We argue, well, you could put black locusts into the recipe. We had an undergrad honor student, uh, Mariella Garcia, one of your guys, you might know her, she was great. And we did some simple static alkali chambers quantified CO2 production from control. We use the tally per child soil with or without populist chips and with or without locust chips. And for sure, and then, and then we had a whole bunch of different treatments, but this one had nitrogen fertilizer added to it. But basically locusts, same amount, decomposed, put out less CO2 than the populace. And so we argue you can add locusts to the recipe and we can sequester carbon. How much? So a 10% volume to volume amendment would give you 1.7 kilograms of carbon for each square meter, 0.2 meters deep. That's 17,000 kilograms per hectare of carbon sequestered. It would take you 20 trees, 50 cent, 15 centimeters in TBH. It's not that big a deal. It's not that much. I, I'm convinced of this areas we're talking about, we could do an incredible amount of carbon sequestration that'll sit there for a long time. The third piece started two summers ago, mainly because the Chinese government said, well, what would this do for saline soils? And we were kind of overwhelmed, but okay, well, let's see what we can come up with. And we said, all right, we'll do a test of the wood chips and we're gonna, because this, if they're flat, all that salt's accumulating, it has to be irrigated, but we'll put it in a ridge and furrow system with irrigation along the top, put wood chips in it. This is what the soils look like. These guys we work with, they work big. So there's about 10 acres of this set up. These are the ridge. This is the drip irrigation tube. This is the wood chips. That's what it looked like. And we get, went back and there was, with no amendment, and they were starting things up there. This is um, goji berry, is a endemic, is native to this area. And so there's what it looks like in the salty soils, even with drip irrigation. And this is what it looked like but in five months. They had a complete crop of sunflowers and goji berry, it's a shrub, so it took a bit, little bit longer. So it's like, oh, now we don't know if it's diluting the salt. We don't know if it's bonding to the salt through cation exchange capacity. We don't know the mechanisms. There's tons of more questions that have to be asked, but it definitely suddenly took this land. Now it's using irrigation, which I, I'm trying not to do that, but still they need to feed people. And so suddenly this land that was totally unusable is now being put into production. So where we are right now, the most recent work gets back at that original issue of what's the goal and how do you get there? And so I was lucky enough working with Harold and then Kirsten and there's this whole, your whole new initiative is to look at soil holistically. And like for farmers, not just, well, what's your nutrient status, NPK, here add some fertilizer, but you, how healthy is the soil? And it's taken across the, uh, the world, it's using this. This is the way we're going. It was a holistic look at all different properties, active carbon, all different ways of thinking about the, looking at the soil. And we said, well, that's perfect. 
it gives us a diagnostic tool to look at a, a degraded grassland so and say what's there and then what does it need and so we're saying oh we're going to use that as this the basis of the assessment and diagnosis of these degraded soils and then help us to determine the recipe and so we went to the, we're starting in the tall grass prairies which are the richest wettest of what i can tell mollusols the ones that are in the greatest shape everything going west gets drier gets a little bit more confusing this should be the best and Kirsten has joined the graduate program in my department and working with us right now she's a master's student and we went out this fall and collect in august and collected soils from relic prairies and in an adjacent field agricultural field as a comparison uh, we have about 300 samples from five different pairs and a couple of interesting take-home message and so that's what she'll be doing as the basis of her master's is doing the soil health analysis holistically and then saying okay we know what it is It'll be interesting to see what, how it compares to the ag. What would we do to restore this? And then we're gonna go west and start looking at like in North Dakota and further. But one of the interesting things came out of this was, um, one, it wasn't so easy to find like virgin prairie. Now they may still be there, but what we found is little remnants in the back of somebody's farm who didn't wanna, it wasn't good enough to grow things on. There were a few that were being preserved, but they were still actually not, they were still haying them or having livestock use them, even in preserves. And it came down to, well, they're not really virgin. Um, they weren't tilled, as far as anybody can remember. That's what I've come up with. What's available out there is, hasn't been tilled in our memory. That's the definition. And so it's kind of this issue of, well, what should, what's the ideal, what's the, what did they used to look like? We did a kind of informal census just for fun as talking to people, you know, at restaurants. Hey, you know, this is tall grass prairies, best soils in the world. And how many knew what a prairie or grassland was? And it, cursed, it was like six of nine did not even know what those words meant. And they were in, I mean, when you're there, all you see is cornfield. A few slew, that's it. For, you know, hundreds of miles we're driving. It's like, oh my God, this is nothing but cornfield. And they had forgotten. They didn't even know anything. Oh, wow. Even the scientists don't, we work with don't really know what these should look like. And so what the ideal, I mean, this may be the best we get for what an ideal is. We're going to go again in the spring and sample more North and North Dakota and South Dakota of tall grass prairies. It'll be interesting to see. Maybe this is the best that currently exists, but it's not what it used to be. We don't know. We've gotten some publications out. We're finally getting those out. We've had some real um, good achievements. We gave a, had, ran a special session at uh, the Soil Science Society last 2016. We've been designated as the flagship project by China for this USDA MOST program. We put in a bunch of you actually agreed to collaborate for this uh, global $100 million global challenge. Last year, we made the top 200, honorable mention, think it's 100 million. Uh, and we were listed as one of the top three most collaborative programs between the United States and China. So we have we feel good about it. There's so much we don't know, don't understand, but it shows great promise. It's, it's parts of it work really well. So I'm open to questions. Um, and again, I'm hoping I'm stimulating. I mean, maybe you all know all this. You know, maybe it's, you know, I'm a, coming from a different direction, but hopefully if you think of things you want to talk about, email me, any thoughts, even the whole interpretation of that epiphany for me that the whole world used to be grasslands and it's all ag and it's all degraded. What the heck happened? You know, that, I mean, maybe you teach this in 101, I don't know. So thank you very much. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah, um, often the limiting nutrient in agricultural soils is nitrogen and you put wood chips into the, in the soil the microbes grab the nitrogen to decompose wood chips with. i'm wondering how that works out okay so interestingly our first paper we put together our literature review one there's not that many studies that have actually looked at wood in soil um, it's, it, a lot of times they'll call them even green compost, or, and it's a mixture of things, not well designated. And they've seen conflicting results about whether you get nitrogen immobiliz immobilization in the soil. In the experiment in Zhigang, did we saw nitrogen drop? We did. 
But it's not clear cut that it always happens in the literature. It may be. That's why for the recipe, you're going to have to add a little fertilizer. We don't know that. But it's, we're adding very, so in that issue, when we're doing the review, C to N ratio varies, let's say 1 to 20, 1 to 15, 1 to 10 for woods. But sawdust, in the four papers I read, is 1 to 5, 500 to 1 carbon and nitrogen. 500 to 1 for sawdust. Why? I don't even get it. So species really different. We're trying to understand why does locusts take 80 years to decompose? Maybe you're not going to get nitrogen immobilization if it's a slow decomposing wood. Maybe ours are so coarse that actually the, the bacterial functioning is slowed down. I don't know. But it's not as clear cut as people think when you're working with coarse wood put under the soil, from what I can tell from the literature. But believe me, I'm paying close attention. We're trying to, and if anybody gets why sawdust is 500 to 1, I mean, you know, they do these studies where they add sugar to see if respiration increases. We'll put in sawdust, that's 500 to 1. And I'm like, oh, what kind of sawdust, what are you using? You know, what is that? I don't know. Thanks. Sawdust is mostly, uh, or, you know, mostly uh, dialon. Doesn't include the bark. Yeah, I know, but even still, when I, when I look at the literature for xylem versus the other parts of the bark, it's not 500 to 1. You know, I don't know whether the fine scale of it, and they're actually getting back. I don't know, but that's what, you know, the literature, when we put it together, that's what I got out of the literature. But the C to N immobilization issue is on the table. It's something we have to think about. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'm curious about your, you know, you're thinking about the source of the wood for scaling this up. I assume it would be, you know, some drip irrigation or in select locations. And that, that okay. Is. Right. That is the question. Everybody keeps saying, oh, wood. All right. So in China, about 20 years ago, they, because of erosion, they set up a program of um, planting trees across all the roads. It's all populous alba. It may be one individual populace have everywhere. So working with this very influential person, we said, look, just give us every third tree and grow something else. And it's all on the highway. They're easily cut. You can cut it, bring it. And so there's a lot of wood available. And it needs to be diversified for a bunch of you know, vulnerability and all. So we have e access to that. Like coming out here, there's hardwoods along creek beds and all. But I, ultimately, you, you might have to grow for me, black locust, grow it near the farm fields. It's a sequestering carbon while you do it. You can actually coppice it, and the same with the poppies. You can cut it, keep it growing, and have a source. But for me, people, oh, nobody would do that. That would cost so much money, or bring it in on trucks. The reality is, like, they put a bridge in near a house that has 20 homes. There are two other roads people can take, and one other bridge. It costs them $2 million for one bridge to 20 homes. And I thought, you give me $1 million, do you know how much wood I can move across the country? How much land I can restore in South Dakota? It's, it's really nothing. One time, and four years later, we're still having benefits from the wood. And if you grow grass, and you give it four years to actually start get up and running, then it sequesters carbon. That's why people keep saying grasslands sequester carbon once they're up and running. It's getting them up and running is the key. So, Growing hedgerows of black locusts and populace are what I'm thinking, and then move it out. Yes. So are you aiming to use this to create cropland, or are you trying to restore this as grassland? Right. So I'm an ecologist. If it's a ladder, then how right. do more can get to it? Right. So I'm an ecologist, and for quite a while over in China, and we can get a grassland back here. And what they said is, listen, we have five times the, human, the population in the United States. We don't worry about feeding them next year. We feed, worry about feeding them tomorrow. This is going to have to make food of some kind. I'm just telling you right now, they'll never have a natural grass. I was like, okay. But then I think you have to have grasses. You don't want to irrigate at all. I think we can get it to a grass and not have to. And then you have options. You could do <coughs> perennial grains. Matt Ryan's talked to me a little bit about perennial grains and crimping. You can have livestock limited grazing if you put the right ones in. Biofuel in the U.S., Switchgrass is being used, which is a native Panicum virgatum, a native grass, very common. And it's a basis for biofuel production. So you have other grass options. If you go to anything but grasses, you get the soil going and jumpstart where you can grow crops, you're going to end up, it's going to degrade again. I mean, without having a constant, the grass is supplying the system, even the locusts, you know, it will start to disappear. For them, um, apparently China, 
as of like three years ago, was not into biofuels, which is really interesting. Um, what they called first generational biofuels. But in second generational biofuels, they're starting to consider it. I think our group might be able to convince them to start as a way to get plants out on the landscape, which then support birds and wildlife. And I think it's got a role, panic regatum or the comparable species over there. So I want grasses back, honestly. It may be a little early for this, but as someone who studies water, have you thought about the implications of water staying there for a long time and perhaps recharging aquifers over a long period of time? So for Ningxia, I mean, the Yellow River is just the only source of water. In the, little, in the city where there's two million people, it's considered almost a town. That's how many people are there, right? And they are sucking water out of the river. And it now runs dry in parts. And so China, the government says, look, you can't take that much. You can have this much. And so the alternative is, like in India, like here, they're switching to groundwater. People don't understand groundwater. And so they're putting in wells everywhere and sucking it up. And so they don't get how limited water is there. It's just intriguing to me. Um, in theory, we could get grasses growing. And this whole phenomenon of condensation, how much more water you might start to build into the system. And, and so. There's all this pressure for water being pulled out of the system. This would at least maybe buffer some of that, but until there's a more holistic look of, you know, about how the world uses water. That's why, to me, if we can just reduce irrigation demand with this, that's a great. Oh, I, mean, Carol, I just wanted to say that we're over time. If you need to go, please go. Otherwise, we'll continue with questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment because, you know, when we were out there, and Rebecca didn't mention it, but the, what the Chinese government is doing in terms of revegetation, at least at the time, they have about 2,000 people go out into the desert, they put these little rice troughs in, in about one square foot maybe, and then they put one seedling of a, of a desert grass in there, and so 2,000 people, they only have about two months out of the year, that there's enough water for the seedling to to even establish itself. Probably 60, 70 percent of them die anyway uh, in the subsequent summer because it's too extreme. And um, maybe they cover without 2,000 people. They cover maybe a couple of hectares. Maybe it's all manual labor. They're putting little rice rice straws in just to make the environment slightly less harsh and to produce the wind erosion. So. They're trying, but I mean, you, you can't in the long term have that kind of an approach. I mean, it's just the, the, the labor needs. And so they're kind of keeping that up a little bit, but it's absolutely impossible. You have to have a much more efficient way of doing it. Yes. Yeah, now I make point up for my family in China and the border is closed or different. I'm sorry, say that again, honey. Yeah, now Right. But it's an excellent point. Again, it's the recipe. You know, what is not there? And we haven't said, gee, what's the chemistry of the rainfall? Maybe you also need to add these because you're never going to get it out of the rain. We haven't gotten to that. Okay, for what it's worth, we're just, oh, it's kind of like, oh, the soil health assessment gives us the diagnostic tool to figure out the ingredients that are needed. You know, that's about where we are and Kirsten will be, you know, where we're gonna look at that linkage if that's the right way. We're really feeling our way little bit by little bit for how to do this. But that's a good point. Yeah. Are you looking at gray water and or sludge So, um, in one of the experiments, you're gonna use the more. It didn't do a great job. And so he was putting it on at the rates of farmers. It had very high electrical conductivity. I don't know whether it got slight. I don't know what happened. But we got much lower growth of the wheat in that, um, less bacterial development. It, it, like the, it didn't help the soil properties as much. Um, it could be that sewage could be a part of it. But my sense of like compost and manure is they tend to decompose more quickly. I'm, we started this saying we need to need stuff that you know, eight years from now, that stuff's not gone. You're not going to get to replenish it. So we haven't, again, it's a recipe. Maybe that's the right thing to add to give us the nutrient piece we need, some readily decomposable material, plus some things that are more slow. It could be a good part of it. I know the whole sewage thing, 
depending on where it comes, if it's mixed with industrial waste, you have, oh, then the heavy metals, I mean, whole Murray's whole thing, you know, oh, this is not healthy. So we didn't start there. We, we actually talked to Janice about, do we need a microbial inoculum? This is so barren. I didn't show up, but one of, they hired actually a geneticist who did an entire analysis of the genetics of the soil microbial communities. And there were all the things you find in our grasslands are there at very small amounts, including there's this one that's unique, the Sky Fiera documented. Native grasslands have this, are dominated by Baruco microbes is the name of the group. I don't, they dominate in healthy gra native grasslands. They're almost gone. And they were like, oh, there they are. There's a tiny amount. So we don't know that we need a microbial inoculum. We were talking about that for a while. The sewage, you know, a compost tea, John has recommended, it could be a way to bring that in if we need it. Not there yet. I guess it sounds like you've had a lot of both language and cultural barriers trying to make that change. So I'm curious about what your strategy has been or will be to, okay. to like change minds but without sort of trampling. Right. All right. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. First of all, these people have become good friends of ours, close friends. They're really great. Um, at first, there was more language, and I didn't learn to speak Chinese. I'm trying to learn the symbols. I work visually. Some of our team are looking to learn to speak it. They spoke it, and they're getting better and better. It definitely affected our ability to function scientifically. We would go once a year, sometimes twice. We thought we communicated things one way. We come back, well, that's not what we thought. You know, it's your distance, and all those things affected it. But what's interesting is, like, this woman's very influential. If we convince them it works, the Chinese government will just do it. It's like, okay, everybody, we're changing. We're doing this. That's how, now, so it's actually kind of like the Beijing Olympics. They had all this um, algae show up along the shore right before they had the boating thing. They had 10,000 people go out with buckets and get rid of it. I mean, oh, we're doing this, you know? That's how, and so we could actually change a very big chunk of landscape using this if we prove it works and it's successful. There's still issues. Like, we don't know whether, and they're worried. Well, is that going to hurt my crops? Is some bugs going to show up in there? And now it's going to, it's like, oh, we haven't looked at that. Okay. In northern North Dakota, we go, nobody's going to do that. No, you know, how are you going to make them do that? They're not going to do that. You're going to have to convince them to put in demonstrations, provide subsidies. You know, the whole schmear is to, it's actually going to be harder to get it to happen in the United States than it will in China. You know, that's that under, underpinning. So it's really interesting. There, I think, we'll make headway. They're buying in. Here, it's going to be a, a slow thing. Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, Dr. Snyder, I'm asking this just out of curiosity. So do you think that the grasses are more like um, competitive in terms of preventing soil erosion compared to like uh, other crops, like animal crops or um, shrubs, trees? OK. That's a really good question. I mean, we're not, I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm like learning prairie grasses, you know. I'm not a grass person, I'm a, a wetland specialist. Anyway, so, but I, there's an awful lot about grasses uh, that is conducive to preventing erosion. These networks of roots, these deep roots, they're there through the winter. They're definitely using tree planting as a restoration technique over there, but they're irrigating like crazy, and they don't have that kind of network of roots that, you know, form a sod, literally. I don't know enough about different species of grass. And so particularly, I guess, I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the tropical grasslands. Like, all right, they probably don't have these organic soils. Are they different grasses that really can handle dry periods and they go dormant? I don't know. I think you're right. I think grasses are evolved more, I'm paying attention to both the above ground structure and then below ground, multiple ways to deal with not having rainfall. But I agree. I think they're probably helping with the whole erosion phenomenon as well. All right. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.